I distinctly remember my single greatest day of employment, the greatest day of work I ever had. I had uh, previously, about seven years before, was hired to start a new company for a large Fortune 500. And it was at the National Awards Banquet where my peers had uh, named me Manager of the Year. And as I got to pose with the CEO of this big Fortune 500 company, they gave me a plaque. And on the plaque, it read, for recognizing our employees as our most valued asset. And then nine months later, they laid me off. <laughs> I remember distinctly, I remember distinctly how I felt. I was crushed. And I realized that from that moment on, the rest of my entire professional life, I would be at best a temporary employee. It was completely undifferent from my parents' generation. My parents, my father, my stepfather who raised me, uh, heck, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, they all came out of college and had one job their entire career that they, that they ended up retiring from. One job. Well, I'm here to tell you that those days are done. They're done. And so if, if we're all going to be going from job to job throughout our lives, I think it pays to find out a little bit about what it takes to be hired and how to be successful in finding new jobs. So, uh, it, it, again, the, the times have changed. My father-in-law, my father-in-law is probably the one exception to this. He's the single smartest person I have ever known in my entire life. If we took the entire campus of UC Davis where we're at here, uh, he, I would count him, he's probably in the top three. He's that kind of smart. Uh, he was one of the head chemists on the atomic bomb. He's, he's the guy that, that helped make uranium turn into plutonium, right? That kind of smart. And uh, in fact, he lived with us, my wife and I, until he passed away a few years ago, probably lived under the same roof for about 15 years. And I remember one time talking to him and uh, I was in his little home office and he had this little jar, a little lead jar. I said, what's that, dad? He goes, I never showed that to you. And he takes it off and he throws this thing. I'm like, what's that? He goes, that's some uranium left over from the war. Like you, he thought that was funny. I remember my, the look on my face as it's sitting in my hand was kind of, it's the same look that my dog makes when it sees a cat on TV. It's kind of, uh -oh. I, I remember distinctly that, that, you know, he's coming from a completely different standpoint. When you're that smart, the world will come calling on you. You never have to look for a job. But the rest of us, mere mortals, all of you here today, right, we're going to have to look for jobs from time to time. And as an executive in the recruiting business, the most valuable lesson I learned on who gets hired and why happened to me about 23 years ago. I was, uh, I was having lunch with a friend of mine, a recruiter, very successful recruiter. Uh, we'll call him Scott because that's his name. Uh, and and Scott's, I said, Scott, what's the key to your success? Now, Scott was the expert at placing executive admins. If you need an executive admin, you called Scott. And he says, the first thing I do is I sit down and I make a laundry list of everything the hiring manager is looking for. I want to know their education and the background and the software they need to, to, to know and, and the work experience. I make that big laundry list, right? You've seen a job description. You've seen the laundry list that, that companies are looking for. He says, I make that list. And then I go find exactly that person. And as soon as I find one that just fits exactly that person, I stop what I'm doing and I go down to the mall. No, I don't need to go shopping, but I go down to the mall. I like to go on a weekday evening or on a weekend. And I find someone working in retail with great customer service and great communication skills and I talk to them. And if they have a third of what I'm looking for, I present the two of them side by side. And nine times out of ten, the great communicator gets hired. Can you believe that? They make this list. They make this list of what they're looking for. And then they hire somebody completely different. And the reason why... Why they hire this person is a lesson that my mother taught me selling real estate. And when it comes to selling real estate, the thing that she always, that she always knew better than anybody is that buyers are liars. Buyers are liars. So you've read a job description, right? Where it lists everything that a client's looking, the company's looking for, the hiring manager's looking for. Well, 
that's this laundry list that they, that they intellectually put together that makes all the sense in the world. It's a logic-based, this is what somebody will be successful doing the job. But then they go hire something completely different. They hire based on emotion, not logic. And the emotion that drives how and why people hire is not the emotion that they want to be successful. If Think about it. Stop for a second. Think hiring manager. Hiring manager, the next couple of people they hire is going to determine their success or failure. So there's a lot of weight on hiring good people. And the emotion that helps them make the decision is not the emotion that I want to be successful, ergo I'll hire successful people. No, the emotion that people hire on is fear. Hiring managers are scared to death that they're going to hire somebody that's going to say or do something stupid and they, the hiring manager, are going to lose their job. So what do they do? They hire great communicators. They hire great communicators because it's less risk for them of losing their job if they hire somebody who communicates well. And they figure they'll teach them the rest. They can convince them the rest. And so that's how they make their decision. A couple of years ago, I was helping an IT director hire some uh, IT support staff, and they gave me the laundry list of what they were looking for, right? The experience and all the software credentials and certifications and all this, uh, and the, the right education. And, and I went and I found two people that fit exactly that model, exactly what they were looking for, and they passed on both of them. I said, why did you pass? What's wrong with these people? I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm putting this person in front of some executives supporting their IT initiatives, and I just didn't feel comfortable putting somebody in front of our top executives. I said, oh, you're looking for a better communicator. So what did I do? I found someone who had a third of what they were looking for, but communicated well. And they hired them on the spot. They hired them on the spot. And so that brings me to job search rule number one. Job search rule number one is that resumes don't get jobs. People do. Resumes don't get jobs. People do. It doesn't matter your resume, your degree, your GPA, your pedigree, your CV. None of that matters when you get to the interview. Because if you get to the interview, they already want to hire you. They already want to hire you. The only thing you can do at the job interview is lose it. And the way you lose it is by saying or doing something stupid. Hiring managers hire the communicator. And so it's to our financial best interest to become the best communicator we possibly can be. Why? Because communication is the multiplier of knowledge. Communication is the multiplier of knowledge. If we take our knowledge... And we take that perfect person who has all of the qualifications, and if we place their value at 100 and they're a poor communicator, they're worth less than the 100, maybe half. But we take somebody who has half of that and they're a good or great communicator, they can be worth two to three times that because they can share what they know. The great communicators get hired first. So stop and think for a second. If we were, if we were to divide the, the world up into poor communicators, average communicators or good communicators and great communicators, that's about one-third for each. A third of you, statistically, a third of you, look around, a third of you are poor communicators. A third of you are good, look left, they're doing it right here on the front row, look left, look right. A third of you are good, statistically, a third of you are, it could stand some improvement, a third of you are great. This guy down here in orange is looking at me like right now, the same look my dog gives me, uh oh <laughs> I know, I saw it, I saw it. So it's, it's okay. You have friends here and you can get better, okay? <laughs> so it is possible to turn our weakness into our strength. It is possible for poor communicators to become good and for good communicators to become great. And I, I wasn't quite sure of this in, until I witnessed firsthand a poor communicator become good. Uh, when my middle daughter was in fourth grade, she was in what we call the poor communicator. In the fourth grade, she was falling apart, and she was diagnosed that year with high-functioning autism. Incredibly smart young lady who had a horrendous time communicating with the world and was literally just falling apart. And as she was in fourth grade, I thought to myself, she is not going to make it to junior high. It just isn't going to happen. And I couldn't even think beyond that. 
but her mother and I and every single specialist and all the help that we could get and through her own work and her own efforts, this poor communicator that can barely get through fourth grade eventually became a good communicator. And she went on to junior high and was successful. And she went on to high school without any help from any additional services and did amazingly well. And she just finished her freshman year at a prestigious Western University. And I'm so proud of her. I have seen firsthand that we can get better. But the only way we can get better is if we believe and put forward the effort. Belief plus effort equals success. And as, we, as we've discussed, it's to our financial best interest to stay employed because the communicators get employed to become better. It's not going to just happen because we wish it. It's not going to happen because we take really hard classes that are really hard. We have to be able to communicate what we know at a higher level. And then we'll have success if we put forward the effort. Again, poor can become good. Good can become great. Now, I never realized how important it was to be a good or great communicator. Then one, one morning, I was having breakfast. I was introducing two consultants to each other, but good friends, Al and Joel. We were having breakfast. My phone starts ringing. I excuse myself from the table. I come back, and my friend Al says, you look white. Is everything okay? And I said, I don't know how to explain this to you guys, but I've got an emergency at home. I have to go right now. And they said, what is it? And I said, that was my wife on the phone. There's 25 FBI agents at my home with Geiger counters looking for uranium. True story. <laughs> now, you think in life, I have to communicate well. You don't think in life, I have to communicate well because I have to go talk to FBI agents with Geiger counters looking for uranium in my home, and they're likely to find it. <laughs> Can you imagine my neighbors talking to each other that afternoon? Oh, yeah, Michael, nice guy, kind of quiet, keeps to himself, right? Right? I'm sure my neighbor Joe across the street, I could see him peering through his window as the FBI are storming my house, peering through the window, and he gives it a, uh -oh. <laughs> It is to all of our advantage. It is to all of our advantage to become the best communicator we possibly can be. And in so doing, we will become and exceed our own potential. Go do it. Thank you.